Hello, and welcome to Five Ways to Protect Your Open Source Code from Software Supply Chain Attacks. Today's webinar is sponsored by Digicert and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is Scott Becker. I'm from Actual Tech, and I'm excited to be your moderator for this special event. Now, before we get to today's great content, we have a few housekeeping items that are going to help you get the most out of this session. First off, we want this to be an informative event for you, so we encourage any questions in the questions box in your webinar control panel. So not only will we have team members responding to questions during the live event, but it's also a spot where you can say hello, which a bunch of you have done already. We love to see where you're logging in from. Now, that Q&A panel is also the place to let us know about any technical issues that you might be experiencing. A browser refresh is going to fix most audio, video, or slide advancement issues. But if that doesn't work, just let us know in the Q&A. It will provide further technical assistance. Now, second, in the handout section of your webinar control panel, you'll find that we're offering several resources. I'd especially like to call your attention to a few resources from Digicert. There's a data sheet on Software Trust Manager, and there are two great case studies in there as well. So I encourage you to access those resources now and share them with your friends and colleagues. A third, at the end of this webinar event, we will be awarding a $250 Amazon gift card to one lucky registrant. Of course, you must be in attendance during the live event to qualify for the prize. Official terms and conditions of today's prize drawing can also be found in your handout section. Just scroll to the bottom and you'll find the link with the details there. Okay, with that housekeeping out of the way, let's get to today's fantastic session. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter today, Dave Roche, who's Director of Product Software Trust, or, or Director of Product for Software Trust at Digicert, sorry. And setting things up for Dave today will be Mike Fleck from Digicert. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Five Habits to Avoid Security Flaws in Open Source Software. My name is Mike Fleck from Digicert, and I'm joined today by our software trust expert, Dave Roach. Today, Dave will take you through how to protect your open source projects from attacks. They've been in the news lately, so we'll discuss how to get visibility into the components of your software and how to spot and prioritize vulnerabilities, among other things. It's my pleasure to turn it over to Dave. Dave, please introduce yourself to our audience. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, hey everybody. Uh, so uh, Dave Roach, I'm the Director of Product for Software Trust and uh, working with Digicert since 2011 and spent uh, almost a decade now working on our software supply chain solutions and code signing services. And so like Mike said, we're gonna delve in now to uh, five strategies to help prevent vulnerabilities from open source software products. And um, I'm gonna just give you a snapshot into the future here. Um, in a couple of hours, depending on what time zone you're in, I'm gonna sit back and enjoy one of these after a hard day's work. And um, if you can't tell already, I'm Irish. Uh, so I'm biased, of course, on my choice of beverage. Um, but when I reflect on the day, it's an occupational hazard that I, I compare how to produce a, a nice point to a nice piece of software. And um, if you can't do that in a, in a watering hole that's nearby you, of course, X has got you covered. You can uh, sign up for some nice uh, um, hashtags and, uh, and handles that you can join in and see what, good, um, what a good product looks like. And whether you're in Dublin, Dubai, Dusseldorf, or somewhere else, you, if you go and you get a good pint of Guinness, it should look the same, right? So this is a bar in New York that I was in one time, uh, beautiful looking uh, product, but again, very similar to one that is in a local around the corner for me. And like software, uh, you can perform your own user testing. And here's a little sneaky one that you might not be aware of. If it's a good one, you do a little tilt, and you can see the quality of the head thick enough that will not pour out of the glass. That is a good sign. There's also some other good indicators you should look out for. And this is after the experience. This is what the consumption of the product should look like, where it hangs to the glass all of the way down. And like software, this is a product that is scales very well horizontally. 
So it's not just for you. You can enjoy it with your friends and, you know, depending on where you are, maybe your family. But again, not endorsing it for little ones here. But software doesn't always go right and nor does necessarily your favorite beverage. And so there's, here's another fun uh, handle to follow on Twitter. Uh, whereby our, our good friends in London are in good sport uh, recording all of the bad examples uh, of uh, Guinness that is being served up. And again, like software, we're seeing that this is not, there is a multitude of different challenges that are, um, that are being posed here. So unskilled practitioners, right? Maybe this is being delivered by an intern or somebody on work experience uh, who's just doing it out of school for a while. Um, reproducible bills, not always a good idea, right? Here is an example of two reproduced um, deliveries of this product, and they're both bad, right? So just because you're doing it consistently doesn't mean you're doing it right. Um, this one, it, it, to me, screams injection, right? There's some dependency issue here. Something has gone wrong. Could be the nitrogen. I'm not sure. I'm not an expert on that, but you can tell that this is just not as it's supposed to be. Human error is a big uh, problem as well, right? Because you know there's some good things going on here, but there's just a lack of quality assurance uh, as part of the process. And then inconsistency, right? So inconsistency in packaging, inconsistency in delivery, um. And just, again, a lack of policy enforcement here is what's causing these issues at this pub. I love this one, right? This is a signature issue, right? The product itself might be okay, but it's in the wrong glass. You, 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 know, you, this, you don't want to serve this to your kids. It's not Coca-Cola. Um, and again, I, I just put that one in twice because I love it. But here's where this product does not scale well horizontally when done wrong. Right, uh, you can't just dump it into a pitcher and expect people to serve themselves. Now, there's a big challenge here. Look at the body language in the background. Right, this is about user experience. There's reputation at risk here of the person who's put these on the table for the person sitting opposite them. Right, this could end up in divorce. Um, and here we're talking about actually, you know, what is going wrong here? Two good-looking products but just packaged incorrectly, right? Maybe there's some pair programming going on here where things got mixed up, but simply put, you know, do it right. You have all the tools, use them and deliver it correctly. And while this one here is just, I don't know what happened. They're trying to migrate to the cloud and everything is just being dumped into the one place and it's just a catastrophe. So let's try and take some of these examples now uh, for, uh, when you sit down and enjoy a favorite beverage, whether it's a mocktail or, or, or a pint or, or a good coffee, um, and relate these to the challenges that organizations are facing when they develop software. And every organization now has some form of software development going in there, right? All those images in the background, motor vehicles, banks, lawnmowers, agriculture, industrial controls. At one stage in time, they were, there was limited software or firmware on them. Now they are all highly dependent on software to function. So regardless of the industry, software now is critical to the experience and to the delivery of services on hardware and in enterprise play software. And so what, what's part of the challenge? Well, because of this and because software is so prevalent, 91% of businesses are reporting supply chain attacks last year. And this is a number that is only going to increase. What else is happening? Well, open source is playing a big role in the delivery of software, right? 99% of software contains third-party components or open source. 78% of businesses are using open source software. And there is over 30 million open source projects hosted on GitHub alone, right? So why is that? Well, that's because your developers who are tasked with innovation about bringing revenue into your organization, they want to work on the things that are critical to that. They don't want to be spending their time on things that are repeatable, logging, compression, things like that. So they use 
standard services that are used by multiple products and they pull that in and they depend on that and they work on the bits that's going to innovate and separate your business from that of your competitors. But, you know, there's a bit of a party going on with open source, but every party, as it says here, needs a pooper, right? There's always a party pooper. So what is it? And that is that open source is now becoming a huge focus for bad actors to uh, infiltrate uh, goodware, um, enterprise software, and open source services themselves to help uh, gain access to uh, the enterprise network, to your end users, to data, to whatever it is. Anything that can be leveraged as a point of extracting some kind of ransom, holding somebody um, um, to ransom, or, 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 or just in general, um, uh, confiscating and using the information that those systems and services are using. And one of the most recent ones, which is uh, one that uh, a lot of the enterprise uh, software security folks are familiar with, is the XZ Utils uh, backdoor. Okay, so this was a, a long con, right? The, the person who was responsible for introducing the malware into this library this year started to contribute to that so that open source project back in 2021 right so they've been doing this for over three years and eventually became uh, somebody who was not just fixing bugs and making contributions but they were responsible for releasing um, and had the capabilities to do so so you know um this is huge in terms of social engineering and there was also other parts of it whereby the the lead for that uh, repository was campaigned by other bad actors to let this person help out because they put them under pressure to get updates and releases out there. So fascinating story, and we'll dig into that a little bit as we go forward. So why is stopping a software supply chain attack so hard? There's a few things at play here, right? Software is really complex, and that's not just you know one one stream of software in, in organizations there is legacy there is new software coming online there are different stages of maturity different languages perhaps with mergers and acquisitions um you know using different tools and services so it is extremely complex and there's no simple solution to it also organizations being siloed and understaffed right so focus on delivery of services without the uh, focus on the quality, right? Where things are getting out the door, whether because there's just not enough time to catch everything, the right tools are not being used to help, or there is some other time pressures uh, being uh, enforced or, or, or uh, influenced in, in, in how software is being delivered. And then the, bro the, the broadness of it, right? Um, the attack surface and, and how diverse that is. So let's look a little bit at, at software project for an example, right? So this is one of the most well-known open source projects in the world, Apache HTTP project. Started back in 1995, and there was eight people, eight developers contributing towards this. And they probably met up in person. They probably knew each other. And um, it, 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 it organically grew from there until where we are today. Over 600,000 contributors worldwide more than 2 million lines of Java, um, multiple platform, frequent releases. So this is now a beast of an open source component, but again, very much relied upon by, by you know, a, a broad spectrum of the enterprise community that requires uh, HTTP services. Uh, they're not reinventing the wheel, they're using this um, to to make that consistent throughout their delivery. Um, and so, you know, what we think about from a broad attack service perspective is, you know, where is vulnerable? Okay, so third-party code, right? We talked about that. Malware being hidden, vulnerabilities, compromised dependencies. But it's not just there, right? Compromises in your own source code. Is it a, a threat from within? Is it a human error? Um, how is is uh, that um, vulnerability and malware being introduced? 
unauthorized changes to the source code? Is there practices in place to prevent that? Exposed secrets, private keys for code signing, uh, API tokens, um, other forms of secrets, right? So whatever it is, those being pulled in to your, your, your products and services in plain text or, or, or something that is not protected is going to uh, give a backdoor access to bad actors into the services that you have. Compromising at the build process, right? So this is where an injection happens. Not that there was issues with the source code, not that there was issues with the third party components that you were pulling in, but an injection in the build process. And this is very difficult to stay on top of unless you are constantly assessing the quality uh, and configuration of your build services and checking for tampering. Packaging, right? So after you've built everything and you distribute it, has, is somebody able to tamper with it, inject something into it, repackage it up and send it forward, right? Um, and then, you know, so that brings the question is what really is being delivered? So um, we're going to talk now about five strategies that help give assurance around how you deliver and what you deliver to make sure that a lot of these uh, things that can arise are prevented um, from being um, a risk or at least reducing the risk. Um, so where does our guidance come from? Well, there's many uh, different industry bodies, um, both uh, in Europe, in the UK, in the US, globally, everybody has uh, some guidance around this and uh, while you know they're all coming from different bodies like NIST and the National Cyber Security Center and the Cyber Resiliency Act in Europe there's some common themes here and we're going to boil those down and help you to try and prioritize what you're doing uh, to, evo to avoid some of those common issues and so we relate it back to um, um, our earlier theme of the, the conversation and say you know don't underestimate the complexity of your software, okay? Not everything is the same, right? Here we're seeing three identical things, but you know, in your organization, you're gonna have uh, some of your teams building different uh, functions. There are gonna be mojitos, there's going to be mocktails, there's going to be cappuccinos, right? So they're not all the same and we can't treat them all the same. And they're at different levels of maturity as well. So. Here you'll see at the top different developer teams working in different areas, some in the cloud, some in Linux, some for Windows, uh, mobile app teams. And then underneath you have the supporting functions within the organization, which are often understaffed and trying to support these teams, PKI support, product and enterprise security teams trying to build, build policy to keep software safe. But how do you enforce that and how do you work with those developer teams that are writing the code and are pulling in the dependencies. And so what happens is these challenges arise, right? No visibility or enforcement, uh, tampering can happen, missed threats, and in general, lack of transparency into what is happening in the process. So these are the things that our large organizations are experienced. There is not a one size that fits all approach here. And we have to work with the different needs of the teams and the different maturity and the tools and to be, but still the goal is to try and solve these challenges here. But recognition that there is a challenge is uh, very fundamental to this. Okay, so next thing you need to do is with your software is to check it right, is to scan for threats and vulnerabilities, right? This at a glance may look like a pint of Guinness, but this is a shepherd's pie. This is not even drink. Um, so, you know, what we're saying here is just because it looks like the product doesn't mean that it contains what it should, okay? Um, so what do we do to try and ensure the quality of the products that we're producing um, to make sure that there is um, delivery in it. So let's take a look at an example of a supply chain here. Um, so we're trying to produce something here. It's milk. It's come from a farmer who's produced the milk via distributor. It's come from the cow. But what can be introduced into the supply chain that the consumer may not like, right? So NH4S, uh, NH42SO4, 
What's that? Well, it's an inorganic salt. What does that do? It helps with the um, consistency of the, the of the processing and the the um, um, the processing of milk before it gets into uh, packaging. What's BST? This is a growth hormone provided to cows to increase their production of milk. Right? These are not things that we as consumers would opt in for if we had a choice of the product that we were consuming. So you need to know what is being introduced and that in terms of software is about open source dependencies, but also everything from source throughout the build to the packaging. And a few of the things we're highlighting here is scanning your code, doing source code scanning it at the uh, Git repository level, right? Software composition analysis is excellent, right? It's able to tell you what open source dependencies and libraries are being pulled into your software and whether or not you have the right version, the latest version, whether there's any issues with it, and if you should update it, what you should update it to. But static binary analysis after the build process is a really great way of ensuring that, you know, when the software is produced, just before you're happy to put your name to it and, and, and provide it to your customers, nothing got introduced along the way. And this will look at behaviors in the software as well as reverse engineering all those open source and third party components that were pulled in. So uh, strength and depth is the message here that we would share. It's not about having a silver bullet, right? Static binary analysis works awesomely well with software composition analysis. Um, software composition analysis can be done more frequently. Static binary analysis, like a final exam before your software ships out the door. Next thing we want to focus in on is around the transparency, right? So what is the software made up of, right? This is really critical and it's becoming more important now as industries are adopting uh, their regulations to ensure that software has software bills and materials um, uh, often in a pre-market submission, like is the case with healthcare and medical devices enforced by the uh, FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, coming on stream in 2025 is the uh, PCI, the payments card industry. They are introducing the requirement for transparency in all the financial software. Uh, from the end of March 2025, all financial institutions who, ad who adhere to PCI uh, will need to also take the same steps as the medical and healthcare industry is doing too. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if you have a big complicated uh, piece of software, like what uh, the spaghetti junction here that the Apache HTTP uh, server looks like, well, you're able to be, tell your customers, this is the dependencies, these are the pieces we're pulling in open source, these are from third party providers, this is the versions, this is the lineage, um, so that they can ascertain, ascertain the quality of what your software is made up of, right? But I think it's a mistake to say that all SBOMs are for providing to customers and partners so that they can assess what you've done. SBOMs are really useful for internal as well. So internal needs for saying, this is the version that we have multiple versions of our software. This is what each version is made up of. And um, we're assessing and tracking all of that. So if some library or dependency where it changes from being safe to today to vulnerable tomorrow, internally you get an alert and you're able to operationalize that. So you're able to take action on that software, make a change, release a new version, alert your customers, and uh, be able to do so in a proactive nature, right? Uh, the PCI requirements have terms in there about updating your software regarding things that are detected, which are critical, and doing so within 30 days. So now there's timelines in place. It's not just about, hey, do it when you can. Now it is do it with a timeline in place. Something else that this is awesome for as well is, is when software is inbound into your company, right? Before you use it, view what it's made up of, make assessments, and be able to assess the quality of the third-party software that you're using and your own employees are using as well. So this is an inbound and an outbound story. 
And uh, it's really important that you you follow after this. So I like this one because um, I, I know on St. Patrick's Day this happens a lot, but but just don't drink this, right? This is an injection. Um, it might look good for your Instagram, but it's not going to do you as a person any good. Um, and so what this represents, however, though, is that while this looks and feels like it should, it's clearly there was an injection done into this. This product was tampered with. Um, and therefore, like software, if software is tampered with, you should be able to uh, inform your customers and the ecosystem where the software runs, inform your customers not to install it, not to use this software. And so what's, how do we do this? Well, we do this through code signing. This is a PKI whereby you digitally encrypt a signature associated with the software when you transport it from, from A to B, whether that's from your repository to a device, to your customers, or when they download it, install it um, uh, from a cloud-based repository into local machines or servers, that it can show that nothing has happened since the sign signature was made. It also helps identify you, right? So this is about saying this is from uh, my organization, right? We stand over this and therefore uh, it ensures that the reputation of your of your organization is um, is passed forward, and you can ensure that the software is um, trusted by your customers. Um, but signing is not just about software on the way out the door, right? You can use uh, code signing to sign open source libraries that are permitted for internal use within your your organization. You can sign your build scripts. Um, you can sign the S bombs. You can sign um, PowerShell scripts, right? You can sell, sign XML. You can do hash based signing of any blob, right? So it's not just about uh, executables like from Microsoft or JAR files or or DLLs and things like that. This is a broad ranging capability whereby you can sign something. There is a signature, and that can be assessed to ensure that what um, you produced has not changed since the signature was made. Okay, so it helps with tampering, it helps show authenticity, and it can be uh, delivered in a multitude of different ways. Finally, like what you want to do in your organization is you want to scale this, right? So you want to do it across all your products, you want to be able to have visibility, have control, and be able to ensure that the things that we talked about earlier, whereby your software is free from risk, is digitally signed, and you're able to show transparency internally and externally, that you can do this in a repeatable way, and you can do it in a way that's policy enforced. So writing a policy document and giving it to developers and engineers and, and developer managers is is literally not worth the paper that it's written on. You have to be able as an organization to help those engineering teams, uh, you know, avoid human error, but also help them to adopt to the things that your organization says is safe and secure, right? So know what you publish, know it is safe to publish, and then protect the integrity of it um, so that it can't be tampered with after you're, you're, you're sure you're happy what it's made up of, and you're able to tell your customers and your partners what it's made up of. So what we do in, in DigiCert is we, we, we bundle all of those together, right? We make it as a, a tight practice within Software Trust Manager where we can enforce that signing will not happen unless the assessment of the software and the threats uh, uh, were that if they were detected are highlighted and then it blocks signing. Right, so if the software is bad and there's something in there, signing won't happen. If the software is good, signing is permitted. So you tightly couple those things. If signing is good, build the S bomb, sign the S bomb, ship the whole thing out the door. But if something goes wrong along the way, revert back out, report back to engineering, get them to fix the issue, stop the rework. Right, immediately go and remediate these things. And what we want to show you now is a little demo around how. Our tools and services can catch issues um, with open source components 
and when they're pulled into your software and what that looks like. So XZ Utils is one that I mentioned earlier on. And, um, you know, up until the vulnerable version that went live in 2024, there were safe versions of this. And when you assess them and you did a static binary analysis of uh, those libraries, it showed up with some, um, you know, just, just licensing type alerts around uh, what was in there just to say that, you know, this is something just to keep an eye on. But there was no no vulnerability, no malware. So we've just scanned it there. And now we've surfaced up the results into our cloud so people can come in. You can see here there was a copy left license challenge around this version. It tells you what to do, tells you which dependency is impacted. And so no concern, right? But let's look at the version now, which is scanned to, uh, which does contain the issues, right? So this is the, the, the latest version, um, uh, 560.1. And again, the assessment can happen. We're doing it here in the command prompt for simplicity, but this can be one line of code added to your CICD pipeline, regardless of whether it's Azure DevOps, Jenkins, GitHub Actions. And uh, the results are then passed back into the DigiCert service. So your users can come in here. You can see this one has failed, right? So let's see, seven deployment risks. Let's go down to the, the results here. And you can see here there's a multitude of issues, critical severity vulnerabilities, malware exploited. So here, this is the behavior one, right? This is about detecting that there is a behavior in the software that looks like a backdoor uh, malware injection. And our technology is able to show that because we've seen these before and the tools and the services and the Goodwill, the Goodware databases behind the scenes are telling us that this looks like a bad um, issue. This is actually, um, and this one is around the signature associated with it. So once the once the malware was found, it was uh, analyst vetted and it was added to the thing. So it was very specific. So if this uh, XZ utils issue is ever used again and it's in any of the software you're running, now we'll be able to specifically tell you that it's in there. But the one around the threat behavior is very different. This is about saying something about the behavior of this software is acting differently. So this won't will not be caught by your standard um, uh, software composition analysis service. It won't be caught by your antivirus service um, because behaviors are not something that th those tools can check. They are checking for signatures associated with known hashes. Okay, so let's talk a little bit then just about success stories. So we have product customers who are using Software Trust Manager to ensure their software supply chains um, are being protected. Uh, ST Micro Electronics, um, uh, very well known uh, organization, global footprint, uh, decentralized workflows, uh, working across multiple different products. Uh, some devices with uh, both software and firmware in it. They're um, most, the reason that was most important for them to use a service was to ensure that there was role-based security, so separation of duties across all of the, the services. So engineers could sign, policy managers could, in, could generate and create the policies and make sure they were propagated down to the teams and also then to separate those teams of users onto the products and services that they were working on so that they're not all using and sharing the same cryptographic resources and bundling all the, re the results into just one big bucket. Um, so um, great success story with ST Microelectronics, and you can read that on, um, on our website. Another one is, uh, is Dina, there's a Japanese organization and um, very much focused on automated uh, CIC delivery of software um, through um, Azure DevOps pipelines. And, um, you know, with COVID and the remote uh, workforce um, that, that a lot, and hybrid approach to work, uh, it wasn't um, capable that they could use USB tokens for key storage and for software signing because you know one person would have that and it was single point of failure. So they needed 
a cloud-based approach where they could share access and capabilities and, and deliver uh, different experiences to different users who have different needs, but do it in such a way that there's no hardware involved. Uh, but they still needed the visibility then, right, to be able from a security perspective to see who signed what and when, who performed an operation, was their scanning done before signing happened. Um, and therefore, uh, you know, that checks and balances were in place. And it's not just about signing software and pushing it out the door. So with that, um, we thank you very much for, for joining um, the, uh, the call today. And um, we say salute and cheers, launcher. Uh, thanks very much. All right. Well, Dave Roach, thanks for putting together an entertaining and informative presentation there. I love the extended Guinness analogy. That was such a great setup for the discussion about protecting open source code from software supply chain attacks. Really appreciate that point, too, about not just generating S-bombs, but using them in internally. One of many great tips today. And if you'd all like to learn more about DigiCert and the solutions we heard about today, be sure to download those PDFs in the handout section here in the in the final minute of the event. The ST Micro and Dina case studies that Dave mentioned there at the end are, are both in that handout section as well. So you can grab those and, and find out more about how they use the product. All right. And before we wrap up, it's time for the Amazon gift card prize drawing. The winner of our $250 Amazon gift card today is Noah Freudenberger from Pennsylvania. So congratulations to Noah Freudenberger. We'll be in touch to get you your card. And with that, on behalf of the actual tech media team, I want to thank DigiCert for making this event possible. That's going to conclude today's event. Have a fantastic rest of your day and don't drink any green beer.